People from Accra come up here to live. They say, oh, I love it because of the nature. And then they come up here and cut out all the trees in the yard. They end up like a, a Accra city in, in, in the, in the Buri. Yeah. yeah. And the, the water levels, you know, the amount of rain and everything is going to stay the same as long as you have trees. When you cut down the trees, it's going to act like a savanna. I'm Vanessa Canby and I was up in the Abri Mountains and I met Leo and he had a fascinating story to tell of his journey from the States to Africa and he has now settled here in Ghana. At the time of this recording, Leo was managing this Airbnb for the owner and the area and the property is beautiful. Um, see. Computers came in later on in life for me, yeah. and I just cannot catch up. I mean, they're, they're advancing so fast, I can't keep up with it. Whereabouts are you from, and what brought you here to Ghana? Okay, I'm a US citizen. I was born in Boston area, Boston, Massachusetts. Nice. And growing up there, I was very concerned or involved with wildlife. I knew the wildlife of our area and everything. But like, even by high school age, the whole place was destroyed for development, you know, mm. and I was really bummed out about that. So then, also when I was 14 years old, I read Heart of Darkness, and I, and I can remember, you know, Conrad as he was sitting on the bow of the boat going down the Congo River and describing it. It was sounded like such an amazing place, and I knew then that I, that's where I had to go. At some point in my life, I had to go there, you know. And then I got involved with construction, with working in America. But then, in 1979, uh, uh, a thing happened that pushed me to do what I really wanted to do. And that was a collapse in the economy. And mortgage rates went up to 29%. People weren't buying houses. We were, I was sitting on a speculation home. I had to get out mm -hmm. and do the things I wanted. So I signed up for Peace Corps. Six months later, I'm in Zaire. Um, I happened to get there two days before my birthday. And two days before, or three days before the celebration of independence of Zaire. Wow, what a time to be there. But the, th the interesting thing was, when I interviewed for Peace Corps, I wanted to go to Southeast Asia, of course, first. I have an agricultural background. And they said, well, we don't, we, you know, we don't have that many agricultural prog programs in Southeast Asia. So how would you like to go about to Africa? And I said, okay, all right, that sounds good. So they described the program and they said, we have this huge country called Zaire and da 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 and da 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 da. And I said, yes. And then I hung up the phone and I says, where's Zaire? <laughs> so I went to the Atlas and found out Zaire is the Belgian Congo. And it says like, I'm going to where I always wanted to be. Mm. And that was in 1980. Wow. So it took six months to go through the process. But six months after I uh, made the telephone call, I was in sitting in... Kinshasa. And I saw Mobutu three days after I arrived there. He was in a motorcade going down the Trans Juin, uh, 30th of June, celebrating the independence of uh, Zaire. And that was pretty exciting. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> so do you speak French? Yes. As well? yeah, so I do you have. speak it before you. No, and I had a serious problem. I mean, uh, you know, learning a language at 34 is not like learning a language when you're 12. Mm -hmm. So I struggled with it, but it was good. I got passed it and got good enough. This is Vanessa from the future and this video is sponsored by Rosetta Stone. Rosetta Stone is a language learning platform and it uses immersion to really teach you the language and it makes it much easier and quicker than learning from a textbook, for example. And I learned French at school, but I can't remember that much of it. So I have been using Rosetta Stone to try and brush up. I'm gonna give you a little demonstration of how the app actually works. There is lots of different units you can take and you can decide if you're just going on holiday, you might just want to take, you know, dining and vacation, which is here. And then there's core lessons and they have this incredible technology, which means you can actually speak back into your phone and they can tell you if you have the right pronunciations or not. Elles écrivent. Elles écrivent. Rosetta Stone has this incredible deal on at the moment that you can get Rosetta Stone Lifetime for $179 until the end of March. It's normally $199, but this gives you access to 
over 250 hours worth of learnings and languages. It gives you access to every single language that they have available on the app. So if you're interested in learning a language with Rosetta Stone, head into the description below where there will be a link that you can click on and you can get your Rosetta Stone lifetime subscription. To get a position as a professor in an outpost. And I wanted to be out in an, in a, an outpost away from the city, away in the countryside and that's what I got. So when I got there, it had its challenges as well, um, but I loved it. It, it. it was like, it felt so comfortable. And it taught me how to live in Africa at the village level, not in a big city, not working for a big developmental company, but living on subsistence living, just getting by and get along with the people and getting, see how things work, get, get your, mm -hmm. whatever you need and, and this, that and the other. So how long did you stay there? 14 it's, years. Oh, nice. And then what made you move from there onwards? Did you move from there to here? Yes. Um, in, in the 80s, it was easy for me to go from Peace Corps to USAID to get a better paying job for a couple of years. But then I went into the science, scientific community, which is what I love for a while, and, but then because of the turbulence, I had to leave Zaire, come back to America, went back to Congo Brazzaville, which was right, right across the river from Zaire. Same Congolese, same thing So in, in, in French, so I was, per, anyway, fine. And I got a job working for a, a Western Lowland guerrilla orphanage, run by a, a millionaire or billionaire that made all his money from gambling in UK. But he had a so passion. Awesome. I know. <laughs> but he had a passion for wild animals. He wanted to have zoos, so then he got the money and he was able to. He had three zoos in, um, in and around London. Okay. Okay. For profit. And he, for profit. But he had the largest community of Western Lowland gorillas taken from Congo Brazzaville in captivity. And he was, because he wasn't associated, directly associated with the scientific community, he could do things with his gorillas that other communities couldn't. And he had the, high, the lowest mortality rate amongst young gorillas and the highest survival rate and reach, uh, gorillas reaching maturity in captivity. So scientifically uh, oriented colonies that were in captivity were coming to him for information. How do you do this? You know, what's going on? And, uh, and uh, getting uh, uh, feedback from him. So is it good to have the gorillas in captivity like that? <sighs> yes and no. Okay, no from the standpoint that, I mean, gorillas are social animals. They have a huge range and it's totally impossible to replicate those conditions under captive conditions. Mm -hmm. So the, the animals are under constant stress. But from a standpoint of educating people on what gorillas are all about, you know, protecting gorillas, conservation, gorilla conservation, then you need some kind of a representation that's open to the public and, expo and the public can be exposed to something like that. Mm. Um, so there, there's pros and cons. And also, too, gorillas are so threatened these days that they're going to, in order to preserve their gene pool, they're going to have to yeah, have some kind, yeah, exactly, like other animals are on the brink of, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, and you're into, as you say, science and sort of plants, so... Well, science is religion for me. I mean, I can't do anything without it, yeah. Well, see, when I was in college, I was a... Well, I entered as animal science major, laboratory animal management, and then I went on to... I was a pre-vet student for a while, and then ended up with a, just a degree in general agriculture. But when I went to Peace Corps, I was working with small animal raising um, for alternative meat sources. And the, the amount of wild game that was consumed in Zaire was phenomenal. And they were just depleting the, the resources, the wild animal resources. In. Oh, right. So that was a concern of mine, and, and I got a little bit involved with that, with USAID and stuff. But it was such, on a, such a grand scale. It's hard to deal with. Yeah. And now you're here in Abri in Ghana. How did you end up here? We are literally in the mountains. It's so beautiful. And this house as well is incredible. What Lots of stories there. 
Um, first of all, I had to leave Zaire and I was held up in Nairobi for a couple of months waiting for a job in Congo Brazzaville. But like the rumblings were going on before the Hutu Tutsi yeah. incident in, in Zaire. So I had to leave Zaire and I was going into the Congo uh, Brazzaville. And there was still rumbling of tanks in the streets at night and social unrest, civil unrest. But I waited until things cooled down enough to set foot on into Congo and Brazzaville, working with the Western Lowland Guerrilla Orphanage. And I worked there for two and a half years, and then the same thing happened again. It was coming around election time. There were four main opposition groups within the city, and they were all armed to the teeth. I mean, the, the U.S. Embassy was even thinking of trying to disarm them, but figured the casualties would be too, too great. Then, you know, there was conflict in uh, Congo Brazzaville, so I had to leave there. Mm -hmm. they, move, they actually moved the guerrilla project to uh, Gabon. Oh, right, okay, so they it, took all the guerrillas. Y the whole project, yes. That must but have been quite a challenge. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure it was, but I wasn't there oh, to, right, okay. to take inbo get involved with that, but yeah. And then from there, what brought you here? Okay, so then I went back, well, I actually lived in Europe for a year, in Brussels. Okay. I had a lot of friends from, from Zaire, yeah. until the money ran out, and then I had to go back to the U.S. to make money and just try to find a suitable, stable enough country in Africa where I could settle have a little piece of land, not necessarily own it, but I mean just have a piece of land for myself to do subsistence farming, subsistence mm -hmm. living. I got involved with permaculture. Um, I had a, uh, Kofi Anku gave me a 24-acre tract of land right up the road from here because he knew if I managed it, I would do, you know, Good I'd thing. be increasing the value of the land mm -hmm. and make it suitable for habitation. Mm. So what is that what is permaculture for people that don't know permaculture is like when you have a portion of land and you work with nature and disturb nature as little as possible but grow edibles into the system right. you know you, you you beef up the natural systems for collecting water say for uh, building barrages and stuff putting in a lake or something like that and then you're working with the trees like you do agroforestry like passion fruit. Passion fruit is a Brazilian plant, a, a vine that grows in the trees and, and it, it fruits. It grows very well here. Oh, great. So things like that, you know, that, that don't disturb. You don't cut down the forest to plant pineapple like they're <laughs> doing here or, or corn, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, great. And then this particular property that we're on just now, so do you manage this place and do you plant here as well or...? Well, that's interesting because um, this property here, the, the house we're sitting at now, was one of the three original owners and developers of this estate. This estate is 100 acres. Okay, they have 54 members. And they, they set up a, a legal binding contract in the beginning saying that we don't want you to cut trees unless it's absolutely necessary, preserving the wildlife as much as we can, and this, that, and the other. But for 20 years, nobody enforced it. And now one of the original owners is coming in and saying, okay, we have to move, you have to start building, da 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 da. And the rules and regulations are there, but they're not strongly enforced. And mm -hmm. as you can see, they're uh, clearing out the area pretty fast. Oh. Uh, it's a s sad part about it. But um, there's still the idea that, yes, they want to preserve nature. In fact, that's the reason why people from Accra come up here to live. They say, oh, I love it because of the nature. And then they come up here and cut out all the trees in your yard. Nice. <laughs> it's <Yeah>. like, wow. <laughs> it's kind of like <laughs> self yeah. yeah. You're going to end up like a, a cross city in, in, in the, in the Buri. Yeah. yeah. And the, the water levels, you know, the amount of rain and everything is going to stay the same as long as you have trees. When you cut down the trees, it's going to act like a savanna. You get a change of, of animals. You get a change of topography. Everything changes. And then you end up with a situation, and then they'll be saying, wow, is it hot up here now, you know? And, well, you cut down all the trees. So is there any flooding issues in this area? No, because you have so much slope everywhere. everywhere. Right, okay. Yeah. And what about mudslides? Well, 
that's one of the problems you're going to have is they, if they cut down, trees. Cut, cut down trees. The whole purpose of trees is to stabilize the, the soil and, and maintain, and then, then they're constantly fertilizing the soil. You get a black soil horizon, and, and it's, it's, it's a whole system in itself. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you come along and you start disrupting the system, then, then you have ecological problems like erosion and, and uh, flooding and things like that. Thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you are interested in any of Rosetta Stone's language programs, head over to my description and there will be a link there that you can press that will take you directly over to them. Thank you so much. See you later.